Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to Seen and Unseen, Poets in Conversation. I'm Diana Whitney, and I'm going to do just a brief little welcome introduction, nothing formal, not maybe like you're used to in literary events where I read everybody's bios. We're actually not going to do that. We're going to go in alphabetical order by first name. Um, so Allison Prine will start, then Bianca Stone, then myself, Diana Whitney, Elizabeth Powell, and Karen Gottschall. So this is the eve of the total solar eclipse. We're going to be doing reading thematically and um, traversing themes of presence and absence, light and shadow, illumination, and maybe whatever the opposite is, and seen and unseen. Um, and then after we each read, which will be you know pretty brief, maybe 10 minutes per poet, there'll be an opportunity for some audience Q&A or the poets can also um, have a little Q&A among ourselves for a few minutes. And then we'll send you back out into the sunlight. So thank you all so much for being here. And please join me in welcoming Allison Prime. Why you ask? Hi. I'm really bad with microphones. Is this working? Yeah. Everyone can hear me? Thank you so much for being here. It's such so nice to see all of you. This is um, this is a special reading for me. I appreciate being a part of Poem City, which I think is um, such a wonderful event. And this is a special reading for me because actually this group of poets, every single one of these poets, are particularly dear to me. They have been my inspiration. They're uniquely talented, brilliant writers, and have really supported me and inspired me and mentored me in my um, development as a poet. So it is like a huge honor to be here with them today reading. Other reason why this is really special to me is because this is my first chance to read from my brand new book that just came out like last week. Loss and its antonym. This book um, just got published, and you can buy it on Amazon or from the press. I haven't actually gotten my own author copies yet, so I couldn't bring any to sell to you. But they're in the they're in the world. They're coming out, and um, hopefully, I'm going to plan some kind of a launch celebration in the next month. Stay tuned. Come and celebrate with me. It'll be fun. Um, so I'm going to start with the first poem in the collection. And again, thank you, Diana, for making this happen for us. The first poem I wrote, um, it was the, the first winter of the pandemic was bearing down on us. And it is called Before the Time of Distance. When I didn't hunger to hear the small talk of strangers, words handed off like buckets in a fire line, serious thoughts confided to an infant, a hundred rains across the surface of the sea, my mother's silhouette against my night window. The season moves towards us like a lid about to close, a dream of a white field, moments before snow build up within us like a saw. Just occurred to me, I don't know if I silenced my phone. Okay, good. Um, portrait of the mother I don't remember. Her brother told me she looked like a movie star, so that's how she tends to move. Slow dancing with my father on a night thick with honeysuckle under flickering stars. Not long after she died, her mother tucked me into bed in her south side apartment and sang me a song so sad I forgot how to sleep. The images slowly sway between there and forgetting. All the bits collected from the cutting room floor. Smell of developer 
stop bath, fixer, grain of the images rough as salt. In the end, every portrait is about light, where and how you find it falling. Somewhere in a white room, there is an old notebook with a portrait of my face I sketched with a soft pencil. So many years ago, it looks like someone who could be my daughter, only no one could. Drive home. From the passenger side window, I spot a bald eagle, shifting in high, bare branches above stiff brown fields. We are trying not to talk about the family or the past. Sky finally clear after weeks suspended between rain and snow. I see an old brick house in the rear view mirror, a half finished renovation with torn blue tarps thrashing in the wind. A year before he died, our father took us to an aviary where an injured bald eagle was brought to recover and sat flightless for years in a glass enclosure. What does it mean to be rescued? Let's pretend this isn't a memory or a cage or a house cold with sadness. An eagle can live 20 years longer in captivity than in the wild. In one version of my life, no one left the house and nothing happened to us. So everything happened within us, and it was just as bad. Is this OK with the microphone? Yeah. OK. Hush. Walking home that day, I pressed my face into deep, fresh snow piled high on a pine bough so I could see the print of myself asleep. I met her at my house. Down in the basement, I put a record on. I lay beside her on the floor. I touched her hair. There, in the contours and shadow, we recognized each other. Our bones nearly grown. She closed the door. The taste of cherry chapstick, the clutch, the release. Upstairs, my stepmother's wooden sandals clicked across the kitchen floor. The dryer buzzed, then stopped. The music uncoiled and filled in. Everything worth doing is worth being terrified by. In the static silence, she reached out and dropped the needle to the groove. That became the refrain we couldn't turn away from, the threshold and the decade and the nameless thing we'd done. Inside, this hour, a hundred snow geese landing in a field. Inside the field, a barely perceptible intake of breath. Inside the breath, a cathedral of doubt. Inside the doubt, a shrine of broken watches. Inside the broken watches, an hour, this hour. I'm gonna read one more poem from this book and then end with a poem I wrote last week. Far north. Spring rolls in hard, swift, brash, heedless. Box elder saplings, blackberry, and burdock break ground any place we leave alone. A dozen dark purple tulips sprang up by the front steps. Did we plant them? Another gesture I can't remember what I conceived, things I once said with such conviction, how I got from there to here. I am not the person who moved here from Pittsburgh decades ago, but I feel her inside me. 
earnest, righteous, drowning in want. I find a broken blue egg in front of our house and I want to ask my wife if she believes it is an omen of loss or beginning. Sometimes I find her crying in the shower and I'm struck by all I can't take from her hands, like the water running between them. So I've never done this before. I did want to say, though, I didn't, I can't sell you my new book, which I wish I could. I do have copies of Steel, which is my first book back there, along with Diana's book and anyone else who brought books if you want to see me after. Um, so I've never done this before. I'm reading a poem that is so new that it is, <laughs> looks like that. <laughs> I don't know what came over me, but it's like a eclipse poem, so why not? Where will we stand when the sun goes out? I want to hold your hand. Our names are inscribed together on a gravestone. It didn't seem strange when we did it. Let's stand in that cemetery and listen for the birds to silence. Wildflowers on the forest floor know their time is before the trees awaken. The forest floor brown with things that have been sleeping, shed, or died. I will never run out of awe or sadness. Last week we walked the empty shore for miles in a mist and fog, you bending to move the surf clams back to the water. I will never stop being washed over by your goodness. It was just us, the surf clams, and two coyotes at Herring Cove. I was pulsing with fear and wonder, sand and fog, worship and numbness. A surf clam can live up to 35 years, so it must be glad for your gentle gesture, as I am. There are warnings that during the eclipse, there will be no way for the emergency vehicles to reach the emergencies, or for the phone calls to touch each other in the crowded channels to the sky. Loving you this much has always terrified me, even before that first touch that changed my body forever. The coyotes stood and watched us, watched them, us all asking each other the same question. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. If you guys need a chair, you can grab one from back there. If there aren't seats, I can't tell. And I want to welcome the amazing Bianca Stone to read next. Play the winter tarantella, making love in the midnight hours on a white iron bed like a dog skeleton, distinguishing the essential and unessential moment shared between ordinary lunatics and screaming over a bird in an apple tree until an elegy has to be written to resuscitate the relation. Those who look towards the depleted wildlife of their neighborhoods with tragic relish to see somehow ourselves disappearing about ourselves. Once in New York City years ago, the internet technician finally arrived. His teenage apprentice stood in my living room over a trans trauma book. And he said it looked kind of cool. <laughs> and he wanted to know what it was. Poetry, I said. What's poetry like, he asked. And the treacherous inadequacy with which one finds oneself 
explaining in a few loose, deficient words, something with lungs and no face, the immortal freak of language you haunt and hunt, which is the original state of language you're trying to get back to from within, poetry, whose rare geniuses come as bittersweet, suicidal explosions on the tongue randomly felt during long, tedious meals, award-winning, but already forgotten, all the emoting of unanalyzable fragments, all the surrender and detonation of precision and reckless insight and references to hidden wisdom and Coke cans, conversations across time and slips into truth and obscurity of thought altogether blissfully the form itself at its best a string of dreams in the waking life overlaid like unobserved clothing the words that sing stillness the silence craved by perpetual auctioneers that which is not the tale of an event but itself an event you know what just take the book i said <laughs> pushing it into his hands. <laughs> Thanks, he said, and took it away, grinning a little. But later, with snow in my head and a thunder in my right eyelid, I was worried, as I was so dangerously then, about dark yet unspoken things. It frightened me, that shiny black and white book wafting around New York City in the back of a Time Warner cable van, <laughs> waiting to be opened, waiting to torment him, thinking of it changing his life. So this is a really new poem, and it's called Memory Palace, which I think we all kind of know what that is. Memory Palace. Every memory palace should have a wet basement <laughs> with frozen pipes and mouse bones. Every memory palace should have my childhood basement at the dead end of Elm Street with its rotted beams and dirt floor, where we stored a mannequin named Greta, who scared us shitless every time we went down to reset the hot water tank. <laughs> Greta, purchased from Pocket's department store, closing sale in 1999. The same store, my feet were measured by those amazing people who used to be in the world, who knelt down in front of you like supplicants kissing the feet of Christ and pressed your big toe through the leather and told you just walk around a little, see how it feels. <laughs> Everything khaki and ketchup red and frosted glass. Santa Claus lived there at the top of the staircase and I sat on him suddenly aware of how grubby my winter coat was and how crooked my gaze. And Greta watched flawless in her prime from her corner in the newest sweater and pantyhose and pencil skirt, not knowing that later she would be purchased by us for 40 bucks. <laughs> not knowing she would end up on the floor, naked, dismembered, her boobs bared for no one but the spiders and the plumbers, her arm lying beside her and her hand with three missing fingers that were kicking around somewhere upstairs. I have no memory, palace. I have tomato paste cans bloated on a sagging plywood shelf. Memory, my botulism exhibit, my lockjaw, my declawed cat. Come over and you'll trip on a cement statue of a cement bag that got wet before it was even opened, all its creases perfectly <laughs> preserved. When I look back, there's an ax in my head and a ripped tarp line over me, there's a white mask hanging on the wall with no eyes, just more wall looking out, so angry, it's frozen in a red toothy smile, guarding what can neither see nor hear, let alone remember, let alone make a palace. Mm. 
Uh, I have this seven, eight, nine, ten. I wonder if you could wear that little thing, little mic on your. Jacket. It's too late now. <laughs> <laughs> Does it sound bad? No, no, it's no it sounds great. That was for the um, the filmer. Oh, so okay. It's a oh, mic. okay. Yeah, it's not. It's not gonna work. For that. Because I was just trying to give you another hand, free hand. I mean, this is... You're working. Something's happening. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to read this one last, and I guess I'll read this one, yeah. Because I wrote this one um, after I was supposed to give a reading in Montpelier, and there was a snowstorm. And uh, we, we, we postponed it till the next week, and there was another snowstorm. <laughs> I came anyway, but in between I read this poem, and I thank God. It's called Old Bio and Snow. There's always a snowstorm coming, and I'm always booked at a cafe on the other side of the mountain, driving on bald tires to give another lecture on Hegel's vision of the infinite whole, and at the last minute deciding to lecture on wind and snow and their effects on newspapers. No, wait, this lecture was about repeating the past. There is always a snowstorm coming, and I'm always booked at a cafe on the other side of the mountain, and I'm driving in the dark, and I am insanely happy, weaving along the winding cliffs, careening down the other side of the summit in a little blue car, parking, sliding a quarter and a meter, and bouncing off my manila folders under my arm, my garbandine overcoat flapping open like a hospital gown to give lectures on vision and snow and repeating the past. <laughs> and if they introduce me with an old bio, so be it. There's no need to mention the latest gummy linguistic situation in words or my recent award for laying on the rug and staring at the lacy, vacant spider webs in the petticoats of a glass cupboard. No, forget the laurels. What matters tonight is time and blizzards, and saving on your next purchase with a coupon from your unconscious. Now, snow, that form of water which haunts, it follows you indoors in obedience to air until it feels fire, then it looks for a place to lay down with fire, only to elope with the earth and move slowly to the sea. I just thought I knew something and light was pouring through me onto the floor. But everything shifts one moment to the next and leaves its dark stain where it was. I remember something, then panic sets in. A metaphor no longer holds like it used to. I master no single existence in the past, yet here I am with my name and my mutant face. It's not real, they say, the past, that is even if an ember is burning holes clean through. Cherries dropped from the tips of cigarettes, fallen many, many years ago, back before they put phones in pockets, and people wrote numbers all over the stairwells, and no one stopped reading a book to take a picture of one of its pages. Ridiculous. Instead, there were long, uninterrupted hours of reading and smoking and talking and crying and your own eyes wept for trivial things as they do now, though looking back you're not even sure who was weeping and who was watching the weeping. Time is also about waiting for an almost imperceptible change in a single tear, a mother's textured silence, the disturbed neighborhood kids coming together in the woods to echo their own households, it's never really about the why in crying, is it? I mean, in terms of narrative, it just comes, resembling meaning, like an old bio, resembling snow, and holding in your mind the object of a spruce tree at whose base a kitten is buried wrapped in a tea towel. And everywhere, there is a white soil coming, carried sideways by wind and down by gravity, a pale inflection on its many cold lips, and it doesn't need to know where it came from, to know it is part of the whole, 
and it is snow, and it falls on your face and ends. Thank you so much. <clears throat>
Three semis stuck halfway up a Searsburg mountain. The state trooper bending to set flares on treacherous ice roads winding slow east-west over the ridge where my mother is relearning how to knit. Her marled stitches furl into a ribbon, loose scarf for an imaginary child, another project she'll never finish. She carries the soft cowl from room to room, couch to chair, with the mystery she's been reading since August. Two. Why aren't the windmills turning when we pass? They raised the ridgeline, but those giant blades stand sentinel above the riddled snowpack. Tension is just trapped energy, the teacher says, rubbing the knot at the nape of my neck. I want to believe her. I breathe into the interstices. Imagine I'd be different with a different man, would soften like a rag beneath his grip. Three. Out on the meadows, the fishermen arrive in darkness, live bait in lidded buckets. They light the wood stove in the metal house, bore a hole through the ice, revealing the netherworld, murky reeds and black mud, the promise of slow perch in cold water. They hook a minnow below the dorsal fin, and it swims around the hole all day, tethered to an invisible line, battering the smooth walls. The only way out is to be consumed. The only freedom a mouth, darker and colder than this frozen river. Okay. I'm gonna move into um, summer season. And I realized this, um, if I can find it, oh, this is a poem I've never read out loud, but I was um, just thinking about darkness and light and this, um, this has both of them. It's called Summer Solstice. Cresting the hill on a high tide of buttercups, daisies, Susans, a convergence of storms from near and beyond. You swore you would never be so free with yourself, but you were wrong. The strawberry moon waxed like clotted cream, and there you were again, loosening the girdle, twining rugosa in your hair, decking the blackberry arbor in a gauntlet of stinging nettles, rough thorns clutching your bare legs, but never mind. You're invincible in your silver link chain mail. You wove a garter of cherry stones and slid it up your thigh. You can survive for three days on dew and red clover. You cast a spell of protection on the forest gate and consecrated the ferns with your nectar. Little moon calf, let this run its course. If he let your imagination like a torch forgive him and keep burning, you could be curled in a sick room under crimson sheets, purging shadows through your pelvic floor. When out the back door and up the green path, there are crowns to weave, petals to pull. He loves me, loves me not. Fingers quick and patient, parting silk from stem. The last one placed in the old hollow apple where you offered the violet and lilac in turn binding June's spell with three opium seed pods, a poppy bouquet in an iron horseshoe twisted with mint and lavender spires, drawing down the moon one more time, while the ferryman waits at the river of oblivion, holds his pole poised in the milk-dark balance, the questions drip-dropping like water in a cave, what you'll give up, what you're willing to pay. So I'm going to read a, a new-ish poem, not like written last week. That's really, really cool. Maybe it'll be in a text poem next week. I don't know. Um, but I actually heard um, this poem is, has the International Space Station featured on it. Um, and the NASA's description of the part of that description is a complex of laboratories and habitats, which is the title of the poem. And I just heard a NASA flight engineer talking about the eclipse and how they have to, when they're sending things up to the space station or sending uh, things up to land on the moon, they have to take into account eclipses and you know the lunar pathways when they're making these calculations. And I thought that was cool. So here we are. Actually, it takes place right in mud season. A complex of laboratories and habitats. 
The dirty iceberg by the back door won't melt until April, but today sugaring season is over. No more clear cold sap drunk straight from the bucket, elixir flowing like an alpine stream, my face pressed to the metal lip, the veins of spring open, the trees offering up their sweetness for days, weeks, the holding tanks full of it, as you boiled at night by headlamp and starshine as the space station arced above us, burning like a meteor, orbiting Earth at seven kilometers per second, 15 sunrises per day. Were the astronauts up there floating or sleeping, running on treadmills, or eating silver packets of space ice cream? Did they dream of us below, standing by the boil, wreathed in wood smoke and maple steam? We are specks on a blue-green planet. March was cold and sweet and brutal. Then it turned. Sudden heat. I gather sap bare-armed in a cotton tee, haul the wagon through boggy mud ruts. In the pails, a scattering of drowned ants and beetles. The last sap is cloudy and oily, some yellow as piss. It's not like love or childhood. When it's over, you'll know it's over. Thank you so much. Please welcome Elizabeth Powell. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's really nice to be with you all. And with all my friends and poets. And so I'm going to read some new poems about, I would say, the divine feminine and the liminal space between the divine feminine or another way of thinking about that might be Mary or Eve as mother of the living and sort of what the yin yang what the, the, or the serpent's tail, what the divine feminine is becoming. Um, and it's based on an article I read in the BBC. It's called The Plastic Bag Lamb Womb. The plastic bio bag womb is a mixture of warm water, salts, a homemade amniotic fluid to support the Lilliputian-sized lamb. Inhaled, swallowed, stewed in the womb, this fluid is flushed through the bag each day, a continuous, fresh supply of moonshine. The lambs begin to develop lungs. The heart pumps used blood to the placenta machine, replenishing the tiny, lamby body once again. The lambkins open their meek eyes, grow a woolly coat, scent glands in their faces, appear comfortable living in their nouveau polyethylene homes. After 28 days released from their bag, they breathe on their own in the lab. Then the long lead to the slaughter room. Only one lives, a favorite of the janitor. The others are killed by injection in the jugular after a shearing. So the researchers can see exactly how beautiful they've grown. Here's a, a poem I wrote for my grandmother uh, about the holiday known as the birthday of the trees. On the fourth year after planting, do we eat the fruit? Today we remember why. Is it that we too are trees in the field emerging from winter sleep about to bloom? Bright star of apple blossom, a memory in my pupil's cascade of pink white. In this bright kitchen where I have loved my children, feeding them double cream and cherries, cooking spring lamb with figs, fresh peas and mint. On this day, I give thanks for the years in each ring of the tree as they put on their leaves. So I put on my ghost grandmother's coat. I have and hold her blue veined hands now 
In the old country, she did not celebrate her birthdays. Her only certificate, the tree of life. I head to the upper orchard to read the sacred text of bark with these hands she has lent me. This is the title poem of my new manuscript. It's called Too Late to Stop Now. This week I dragged the Christmas tree out like a corpse. I was homesick for mutual assured destruction in 1985. Love was a meeting of solitudes, the thin tissue around ornaments, and in the neonatal unit saving junk sick babies. I drank oolong tea in bed read DeLillo, had a neck ache, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. I rocked some preemie babies, made new cells, a couple of poems. And in the hospital, lymph nodes, margins, 10 inches of snow. I didn't take anything personally except when I did. My neighbors telemark skiing, bonfiring their vanities and lost numbers, words, minutes, space, knitting needles, life. There was still a God, and the maple, apple, bunt cake went stale. I realized everyone was my dead mother acting in a Beckett play. I accepted this week, all previous weeks had prepared me for, with its nervous dirges and the Tibetan book of the dead. I was still this Elizabeth and the soul who claimed this Elizabeth. This week, love in my pantry, on my doorstep, on my tongue, the ice cap caps kept melting, a terrible sun. And I'll read one more. It's a series um, of poems based on clouds. And the clouds, uh, it's based on an, in, uh, an Indian epic poem where <clears throat> The clouds are sent across the mountains to deliver a message to the beloved. But in, in my book, the clouds are um, sent with messages uh, sent by me as a child to me in the future, and vice versa. Cloud song. Why don't you open the red gingham curtains now? It's morning again. Get your hiking boots laced. Coffee percolates the scent of your homemade life. You can surrender yourself to your mistakes. I'll be your witness. Isn't that why you sent me from your childhood sky across time and space? I set sail on the sky over the Catskills, over the green mountains, traveling out to go in, the trail map left by those who came before. Each blazed blue marker painted on a tree where the route turns toward the summit is where you can leave a mistake behind. Go upward over the ridge of falling stones. The closer you get to the peak, your mistakes will sink into the carrion and moss and make you stronger and more mystic. Why do you think I merely hide the presence of God? You can be yourself in any tense you like when you lie in the grass and look at the sky. Youth's mistakes like wine that ages well makes blessings out of fermentations. Don't ignore storm signs. The more you become the moon, the more responsible you are for moving the tides. Pay attention to the magnetic force that is your compass. That's how you will find your direction. So stop trying to understand the difference between obsessions and prayers. Where has it gotten you? So thank you. And I'd love to introduce my friend, Karen Gottschall. So um, please help me welcome her. <laughs> oh, I know I'm going to have a problem with this, but. <laughs> Um, oh, I'm 
super delighted <laughs> to be here and to um, read with my friends. It's been really beautiful to hear your work. Uh, okay, I'm getting the signal here. That, um, can people in the back hear me? Everybody can hear me? Okay. Um, and I, I want to thank Diana for um, wrangling us. I know sometimes I'm especially hard to wrangle, so <laughs> I really appreciate uh, your efforts in putting this together. Um, so coincidentally, my the manuscript that I've been working on, um, well, I have a couple of manuscripts I'm working on. One of them is actually called Eclipse Season, which, um, you know, the, I came up with that name a, a while ago, and this thing that's supposed to happen tomorrow was barely even on my radar at that point, so I'm not like trying to monetize or like <laughs> sell out or anything like that. But um, anyway, um, I think in some ways these my poems lately are all about middle age, which feels like eclipse season in some ways. Um, so this um, is the title poem, Eclipse Season. Clouds darken and spoil over the hills. Then crabapple crab apple petals come down with the rain. In the house where the glass blower lived, in the field beyond the radio tower, horseshoes and ashes. I once stood at the curve of that road, eyes adjusting to darkness to witness the comet, a controlled burn. When she was dying, a guitar kept her warm. Music is time expressed through human bones. Animals look into our faces and are gone. I hold my breath and begin again. And this one's called Orbit. I knock about in my space station, a bean in a rattle, aging out of my high-tech suit. There's no way to know what transpires on Earth now that the dials have frozen. My few possessions, a silver necklace that turns my throat green, a pistol and a pie recipe, though no apples grow in the exosphere. I remember long ago, back home, watching my mother on her own mission her light moving slowly, cutting its curving line across the night sky's dome. I'd wave as she passed. It seemed so austere and important, that life in the cosmos. But I was pulled back to Earth by hunger and homework, then my own liftoff. I don't know how I survived so much weight, my rib cage a straining chariot. They call it long odds, the sound of drums, one can live a long time on static and broth. It's the loneliness that reminds me I will do my duty. From the porthole, my old life floats below that blue and distant curve. This one's called Survival. <clears throat> When the blizzard deepened its wedge against my door, the Wi-Fi went down and the plow didn't come. The Norway pines bent low around the house and told me it's okay if you disappear. I slept most of the morning that made coffee on the stove. I've always just wanted to know how to live with myself. I think this is a common problem. I hadn't quite made up my mind, but I thought I should at least shovel a path to the wood pile. Lately, there's this owl comes around and it floated down, silent and quizzical as I stood in the cold. The pines were quiet and the owl just watched, wondering how I'd manage my survival. Some days I don't want to be responsible for one single thing. The snow was deep but light. I remembered as I cleared the way to the shed how when my mother was dying, she made up country songs to give the nurses a laugh. And later, when it got so bad, I told her she could go. I know I was doing my best. I said, it's OK if you just stop now. And she did. The 12th century. I left myself asleep in a hotel room in Montreal. 
a spacecraft bound for the edge of the galaxy. Grainy film with burnt out frames, the taste of the monkey bars in third grade. A feeling that everything good was denied you except what you were able to hold so quietly it was almost a form of theft. The house across the street is all lit up at midnight, a shipping container, the raw material of plastic dolls, laws of dress, laws of acceptable speech, how many eyewashes, how many eyelashes awash in the ocean. <laughs> Climbing into a cabinet to rest, Climbing into the 12th century between convent walls, the river is a girl playing solitaire, blue ink on her sleeve. Okay. My tall grown son walks wordless past me in a dark field where crickets chirr and the wind carries a smell of burning wood. He wears a Spanish wedding gown, stiff black lace over whalebone cinched tight, hem scraping the dry scrub of the field. I watch him move toward a white ladder that rises higher than I can see. I think I could still follow him and realize that is something I have always believed, even though I can't remember my son's name or what it was to give birth to him. I watch his still face behind the veil, the pale skin of his hands. I should go to him and offer the lemons from my palms. I should offer to climb the ladder instead. My strong son, this bride, so grave as he climbs slowly higher until his black gown vanishes against unbroken black above. This one's called The Stones. An hour or so along the railroad tracks, chicory and Queen Anne's lace, I come home with a tick on my knee. Who decided on the sound of the dial tone? When was the last time you heard it? Time isn't spent like pennies. It is the fountain pennies are thrown into. The neighbor's motion detector goes off when the fox walks across the lawn. Last thing I remember before I died was dropping a needle with a hiss onto the spinning black disc of my mother's favorite Stones album. I feel like I've been reading forever. Um, <laughs> trying to. You have it. Um, the vanishing point. Was I really born of my own bold mother, all ferocity and diving underwater? I stood shivering on the dock while she crossed the lake. I watched her strong tan arms and four decades passed before she remembered to return. No, she was back by sunset and then she put her mind to other things. I put my own mind to nights of childhood so dark my body threatened to dissolve into deepest sleep, the damp thumbprint of the summer solstice. I've always been old. It's a trick I learned to keep from aging. How could I trust such depths and currents? From where I stood, she seemed to slip in all her youth and energy below the horizon's curve. If I had a hundred daughters to swim away from, I still would never be that young. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I will skip that one. Um, okay. Two more. The last ice age. I have a habit of withdrawing into the Pleistocene epic. <laughs> I empty all my language into the fire and my skull grows large with silence. At night I fall into the sky. I take a dog to bed and sleep until we both need meat. The stars tell me nothing I do not need to know. Everyone I've ever loved has been keen with hunger. Everyone I've lost has been buried with their bone beads and there is no need to visit their graves. I am on the wide plain with the running horses. My body is a simple instrument for the wind to play. 
And this one's called The Lake. I row my small boat through the shallows. The universe ends where fog begins on the rocky bank. Nothing exists except one crow rattling above the outcrop. In all my time on earth, I have learned one word. My mouth holds it like a coin. Almost soundless, water ripples where my oar dips, pulling the scent of copper from the lake. Eddies open in the wake, all I cannot say. My arms pulse with the weight of it. Thank you. Oh, wait, I can turn it back on. Okay, wow, amazing poems. I love that we ended with eclipse season. It's really like that your book happens to be <laughs> our theme. Um, so we could do some audience Q&A. The poets could come and sit on the edge of the thing, but there's also no pressure if you just want to either slip out the back or... Um, <laughs> Let us um, ask questions. Just a round of applause for all. <laughs> Does anyone have a have a question? If not, I guess I wanted to put out a question to the group, which was um, when you were thinking about poems to read that sort of loosely orbited this theme. Was it challenging, or did you find that you almost had like, too many that could apply? And yeah, anyone who wanted to. Can you guys hear OK without the mic? Yeah. 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 Oh, good. Um, Should I we just turn it off? Yeah. yeah. I, I like literally felt like every single poem I wrote, <laughs> ever written, would fit into that seen and unseen. I mean, I feel like it was very easy. Yeah. It was not hard. Anyone else? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the seen and the unseen are like probably the biggest theme for me in poetry. And it's taken a while to articulate that to myself, but poetry as like an object on the page is really like an incredible individuation process of like bringing this scene and the unseen together and the inner and the outer world into harmony of a kind and that reality of the unseen is seen in a way but it still remains unseen which is the incredible thing about what poetry does mm -hmm. and I I mean I didn't have to think. <laughs> I, I I had a, actually which I had a newer poem that I didn't read just because I didn't have time. But like it was meditating more on the unseen idea. But I think um, well like the old bio and snow yeah. one, which in, is about a lot of things. But I think the idea of the whole with the W, um, right? That is bringing into harmony. Um, we are as people like. W. H. Auden said the poem is like a pseudo person, and I always think of that when I think of the fact that we are all pseudo people, <laughs> because there's so much unseen at work in our consciousness that we, to make it, it whole and seen, we need something like the event of the poem in relation to the reader, poem, and poet together. So. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So I love the theme. Yeah, and I love we kind of just everybody yeah. just pulled together some ideas for the theme. Um, I think that was maybe before we knew that we had one poet who was actually writing a book on the. I mean, I'm actually interested in when your eclipse season, you can, I mean, you can answer the question too, but like when your eclipse season project took shape for you. Um, oh, well, it's, it's just, a, it's a manuscript that's 
had about 20 different names <laughs> over the course of its lifespan. And uh, that's where I kind of landed now with it, and it's kind of stuck. I, I don't know, it was probably, um, I think probably Al Allison, do you remember? <laughs> Allison's my, like, <laughs> like the person I text who's in, and I'm like, what about this? Like, I don't know, it's probably been a year or so. Um, and I wasn't really, I guess I knew that this was on the horizon. Like, I found a friend who's been obsessing about this eclipse for, like, three years or something, so it was, like, in my mind, but, um, yeah, just kind of, I don't know. So when you were um, choosing poems like around the the theme, was it was it hard to also like winnow down which ones to read? No, because I really do think like when I think when I think the title for me is representative of midlife, which mm -hmm. is like where I am and feel like I've been forever. <laughs> um, and I love that one um, that you've always been old. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. Yeah. So I think since like my poems kind of are on, I mean they feel very concerned with that, with you know the the weirdnesses of midlife and loss and everything that comes along with that. So it felt like, I, yeah. I mean I just pulled out a bunch of poems yeah. that seemed. Like a good variety. <laughs> I mean, I have never thought, I'm thinking of, I've been thinking a lot both about midlife and about uh, the eclipse season because it's just been everywhere, but I haven't thought of them together until hearing, but I'm really um, enjoying that. I see a question about um, how you chose what to read. Pardon? That, the original question about. Um. Yeah, I think a lot about the left brain and the right brain and how it's kind of a yin-yang mm -hmm. and the things we want to say that our right brain can figure out and then the left brain wants to just blurt out stuff but the right brain holds back <laughs> and that tension and um, I'm really interested in that tension because it just feels like I keep hearing everywhere people say they can't say what they really think. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Um, spiritually, when people have to not say what they think or lie to exist. And so I'm, I'm interested in that, in that tension, I think. Yeah. Um, the things we know and the things we don't know that we don't know. And I feel like I'm kind of, I've kind of snowboarded over middle age. <laughs> And become a grandmother recently, and um, and it's like a friend of mine said, "Oh, 60 is really nice," and I have to like agree. Like, um, it's okay if there are no answers and there is the silence, but to be free to speak mm -hmm. um, some sort of human or spiritual truth, and that that can always change, and nothing's black and white, and mm -hmm. so. I don't know, I keep saying to my husband, Hans, I was like, what's, what's up with the eclipse? Why, is, why should we care? Yeah. No. Like, I, I understand it. It's a natural world, and it's metaphoric and everything. Mm -hmm. I just am having a lot of trouble dragging myself mm -hmm. to witness it. It like, feels like a forced witness, so mm -hmm. therefore maybe it doesn't need me. I don't know. Yeah. But I'm sure it's going to be very beautiful. And um, I'm worried about my dog, weirdly, and, right. and my grandbaby, like, should they go outside? Yeah. <laughs> I'm really glad that you organized this. It was well, so nice perfect. to read with I mean, I just wanted to do something for Palm City, and literally the only time available was like the time, the day before the eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been interested in the whole um, like media frenzy and the um, astrological meetings of eclipse season. Like the astrologer I follow talked about it being a time of just wild instability, um, like the usual um, energy of things is disrupted. And I guess the ancients were very frightened of eclipses. And in fact, it was not believed to be a, a good thing to go and witness them. Um, obviously, that's that's well, not right. Probably blind you. To right. That. <laughs> yes. Probably wasn't a good thing. Then. No. So there's that. But I think there's like um, 
some battle that might have happened centuries ago, uh, like a Chinese, I just, if, if there's a story in, please correct me because I'm speaking really broadly, but where an eclipse happened and there was, you know, anything that was tragic or violent was blamed on this. So I've been thinking sort of metaphorically and um, so the astrologer I follow was like, it's, it's best to just stay in bed and not like go out into the eclipse. Which, yeah, I thought was interesting, but in terms of the wild instability, I've been watching the media talk about, you know, the traffic and even the librarian at Pope City was like, maybe you won't be able to even get into Montpelier for the poetry, oh, yeah. but here we all are. And then um, I was thinking, when you talked about divine feminine, how there is something interesting if you're going to think about the luminaries of the sun and the moon and the moon, you know, traditionally feminine or emotional, basically blocking out the sun, which is more like the light, the day world and the rational and that being really frightening for our, you know, our world of rationality and patriarchy and all of that. So I was wondering if that was why there were all these dire predictions about running out of gas and no cell service. Um, if it was something about some darkness occurring in the middle of the afternoon and what was what are the animals that I've been wondering about my dog too. Um, what are you doing? I haven't been worrying about my dogs, and now I, um, <laughs> <laughs> what is the concern? Um, it's more that I, I've been hearing, and I'm going to let Leah talk about her dog, just that the animals are going to be very sensitive to this period of totality and that we, I don't know what like the day animals are supposed to do, but supposedly the night animals may start calling. So I don't know what you're thinking about for a dog. That's so badass, though. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. I want the but night animals to start calling. Me too. <laughs> I mean, I think yes. There's something really, I feel like there's all this good energy. I, I feel excited about it. I, I feel like there's a binary, of course, in the sun and the moon, and the, the feminine and the masculine, and all the symbolism behind each each one, and then they're coming together right. at once, and and that's a really powerful, even just symbolically powerful. But it's something we can witness and look at, and and I keep thinking about. It. I didn't read the article because it, I just didn't. But it was like sun has consciousness, and everyone was like retweeting it, <laughs> making jokes about it, and I, and all the poets were like, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, they should be like, yeah, okay. Um, but I, I keep thinking about that, and I keep thinking about the, like, again, the unseen aspects of consciousness that are so manifest in, in, this, in, in our planets, and this is, a, this is a real moment. So the uncertainty is really exciting, Yeah. but I feel like there's some great positivity in it because we are in like such a shift anyway in our culture and our world and mm -hmm. the weird weather and like the global warming and the locusts are coming and I don't know it's just like yeah. it's kind of exciting this is the end and we'll be reborn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also think it's exciting uh, this thing about humans having an experience of wonder kind of all at the yeah. same time. Yeah. And like putting their phones down because you actually can't. I know, fuck taking a picture of no. it, right? Just no, like, yes, you're not supposed to. I actually went to the eye doctor and they were selling like a special thing that you had to put over your phone camera if you want to take a picture yeah. of it because you can't look. Yeah. But it's like, let the New York Times take yes. a picture, you know? Like, no, let's just, let's just, let's yeah. just yeah. put it on our glasses. <laughs> and like, you, like, it's like the line from your poem about people used to read, be able to read a book without stopping. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. 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 Right? Like, we're to yeah. actually bear witness in community, yeah. whether it's like your loved ones and your dog, or like it, there may be people like on the side of a highway, like looking at the heavens, which is what I imagine like the ancients used to do before right. people could even read, right. was like tell stories in the sky and the constellations. Well, it's interesting to think about how we respond to things in, because of what we're told. Like, we're, yeah. the information is great, but then sometimes it takes away from mm -hmm. just experiencing it. So right. we're thinking about 
what it's going like what the traffic's going to be, what the temperature. Yeah. It's like what if, there's an interesting article in the Vermont Digger, I think, about a guy that's 104 mm. who experienced mm. it when he was yeah. 11, mm. and oh, wow. and they asked him what was that like, and of course he's just like, well, we just we mind our own business. <laughs> <laughs> I had a moment today where, I don't know how many other people have done this, where I took those eclipse glasses, mm -hmm. which have been sitting in the house for months, and put them on and looked at the sun. Yeah. yeah. It's this big. Yeah. It's a tiny little oh. Teeny, oh. tiny oh. little thing. So I want to do that. Yeah. It's going to be a very interesting thing for people to, who haven't done that to say, wait a second, in the newspaper it's this big. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. There's going to be this, yeah. all this expectation. And then there's going to be some, I think, disappointment. Right? I think it's going to be much, what I imagine mm -hmm. is such, it's not, I don't know that it's going to be as visually mm -hmm. interesting as it is going to be energetically interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like all the feelings of dust that we're, I mean, we're, we live with these rhythms and it's going to be like the afternoon and then all of a sudden it's going to start feeling like it's cooling off yeah. and it's going to feel like it's nighttime and I don't know what we're going to feel like. How long does this last? I mean, I, well, for the total, I it's a three-hour span between oh, really? when it starts to... I listened to this NASA guy yesterday, uh -huh. so he talked us through it, where, where the shadow, the lunar shadow starts to cross. And then the actual totality, when the shadow fully covers the disk of the sun, from our perspective, mm -hmm. will really only be three and a half minutes, but then by the time it crosses the other side. So it'll total three-hour span. Um, so but, it's going to get darker gradually, and, but I think that just this feeling of darkness coming and then growing and then momentarily to be dropped in darkness in the middle of the afternoon mm -hmm. and then the, like, the set, like the birds quieting yeah. and animals shifting and I think we're going to feel all these things that we may, I mean it's not like I think that much about like what is going on with the birds at dusk or, but I think we're going to, all of that is in our awareness and it's going to be happening in the middle of the afternoon. I hope I'm somewhere where I can hear more and not just be in a big crowd. But I think it's going to be something yeah. that we feel. And I, I don't know that it's going to be that mm -hmm. spectacular in terms of like the, then That's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> But you won't, your tiny sun will not be as interesting to look Yeah, cool. a little bit of cloud is so The one in your glasses <laughs> is it. <laughs> I just wanted to tell you don't worry about your dog. I instantly got anxious. Yeah. I looked it up. Okay. They're outside every day and don't look up at the sun, so there's no reason to think they're going to do that at this point. I know, it's only like the one in the heart is squeal. Keep them inside. Okay. And yeah. also, I didn't get to hear all of this wonderful reading, but I'm really grateful for the last three readers that I got to hear. I just drove up here to see my friend Rick from New Hampshire because it's the weekend of the eclipse. Yeah. <laughs> OK, well, that's reassuring about the dog. Yeah. Yeah, so I asked that my niece about her baby. And mm -hmm. I'm like, aren't you, you know, she's two. And she's like, she's not going to look at it. She's no. a visual thing. I mean, yeah. Yeah. She's like, I don't, I guess. I don't, I don't think any like babies and dogs get all the babies like levitate. Yeah. <laughs> Sixteen-year-old who is a real risk taker. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. Wow. Well, thanks, everyone. Are any other thoughts or, or yeah? I just had a question. Of, I'm wondering where you all came from. Oh. <laughs> That's right, because we didn't read bios or anything. Do you want to just start? And I came from East Middlebury. Uh, I came from Brattleboro. But I'm actually up in Craftsbury Common for the weekend. Awesome. I heard your uh, interview on WEV. Oh, oh yeah. And I remember, that I remember you said you were going to be in Craftsbury. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad that I was heard great. that. Good. Yeah, it was interesting because he asked me a question that I felt like he should have answered, which is like, why do we want poets to tell us about the eclipse? <laughs> I was like, well, you want me? Yeah. <laughs> That. <laughs> uh, I drove over here from Brandon, Vermont, which is just over the Brandy Gap, Rochester area. Um, was that nice not to have snow? <laughs> yeah, it was very sunny and beautiful, and there, there's lots of snow on the sides of the roads, but not on the road, so mm -hmm. it's nice. And um, I grew up in Vermont and moved away for many years, and now I'm back. 
I came from Burlington today, but originally I came from Pittsburgh. <laughs> I came from Underhill. Yeah. And just interesting, is everyone here from Vermont or do people come from out of state? We're from New Jersey. Oh, great. <laughs> Welcome. How about the earthquake? Yeah. No. It's terrible. Okay. Oh. Nobody's going to see the earthquake. <laughs> I've been doing Michigan Vermont thing for the last seven years, but I was in Vermont for like 20. Nice. Yeah. And now you're going back and forth. Yeah, children, grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But here for home city. Yeah, always. Always. Oh, oh, nice. Great. Good. Wow. There's some astrological concern because the earthquake was a magnitude 4.8 and yeah. the eclipse is on 4.8, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's a really amazing book for children called A Beautiful Moment mm -hmm. About the Eclipse. Oh, and you can, it's, it's out of print right now, but you can Google and have somebody read it to you, and it's just really lovely mm -hmm. if you're... If about you're, a total solar eclipse? Yeah, Great. A Beautiful Moment, and it talks about how we are experiencing it together, some of the things you all yeah. said. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Also, Great. like, once upon a love time, I was falling in love. <laughs> now I'm only falling apart. <laughs> 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 